Our scripture reading today is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. May the Lord be blessed by the reading and hearing of his word. Please be seated. Protect the body. That is our title this morning, Protect the Body. What kind of things do you put into a safe? Someone. What do you put into a safe? Jewelry? Valuables? Money? What else might you put in a safe? Guns? Okay. Documents? Good. Why do we put them in a safe? Because we want to protect them. We want to prevent their loss or damage or from being stolen. Sometimes something precious uh, is protected by guarding it, right? By putting it in a safe, by putting it somewhere that is going to be preserved. Other times we protect something by removing something from it. Does that make sense? I've often joked with parents that you can tell how old somebody's kids are by how high the breakables are, right? Because when you first have a baby, all the breakables, you know you have a figurine on your coffee table or on the end table, right? And then they start to crawl, and, and the figurine moves up on a shelf, right? And then they start pulling themselves up, and it moves up another shelf. And then they start walking, and it moves up another shelf, right? We're removing the breakable item from the place in which it could be damaged. The saying goes, the person was like a bull in a china shop. Why is this said? Because you don't want to have a bull with horns and thousands of pounds in a china shop because they're going to break things. And the point is, if a bull got into a china shop, you would want to remove them as quickly as possible. Here is the point of everything that I'm saying. Decisive action is taken to protect things of value, right? When something is worth protecting, we're going to do whatever is necessary in order to protect it. And this attitude and this ideology lies at the heart of what Paul is going to say to the Corinthians in this letter and specifically here in chapter 5. The Corinthian church is headed into danger and Paul wants to protect them. So with that thought in mind, let's pray and we'll get into the word. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege that it is to speak your word and to hear it proclaimed. We just sang the song, Speak, O Lord, and that is our desire. We want you to speak to us today. And we recognize that you're going to do that through your word. You're going to give us guidance. You're going to give us direction. You're going to give us purpose and meaning and everything that we need through your word. And so I pray that, Father, today I would clearly, passionately, and effectively communicate your truth to your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Christ needs protection, and it needs protection from three conditions. Decisive action must be taken to accomplish this protection. That is what we're going to talk about this morning. Protection frees the body to function as God has designed. So, condition number one. There's three conditions that Paul mentions here that we need to protect the body from. Condition number one, protect the body from infiltration. Protect the body from infiltration. I have here a little bowl of frosting. I just got every kid's attention in the auditorium because I have a bowl of frosting. So I have this bowl of frosting, and it is white. And I have here food coloring, okay? I'm going to take this food coloring and I'm going to put just a little bit 
into our frosting. About five drops, okay? Now, if we're talking ratios, there's a lot more frosting than there is drops, right? So if I mix this up, it's, the frosting is going to turn the drops white, right? Everyone's shaking their head. Why? Because that's not what's going to happen. As we stir this up, what happens is that the frosting changes, changes to red. Well, actually kind of a pink because there's not a lot of red in there. What just happened? Well, the frosting was infiltrated by the red dye, and eventually it took over the frosting and made all of it red. It doesn't take much. See, when a little bit of bad is allowed to remain, it corrupts all of the good. When we allow the body of Christ to be infiltrated by sin, it corrupts the whole body. And so, sin must be dealt with to protect and preserve the body of Christ. Sin must be dealt with. How do we do that? How do we protect the body from infiltration? Two actions that we need to take to protect the body from infiltration. Action number one, we need to expose the problem. We need to expose the problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're just going to focus on the first part of that verse right now. Your glorying is not good. Your glorying is not good. This is an indictment. Paul is telling them you are getting this wrong. You're getting it wrong. Why does he do this? Because we can't correct something if we don't know what is wrong. Does that make sense? So he's specifically telling them this is what you're doing wrong. You're glorying in the wrong thing. The implication is that the Corinthian church thinks what they are doing is acceptable. And if we were to go back in chapter 5, we would find out what the Corinthian church is doing. They are boasting in the fact that they have a man in their congregation who is in an immoral sexual relationship with his stepmother. And they're going, woo, aren't we tolerant? That's what they're doing. And Paul says, your glorying, your boasting is not good. They see nothing wrong with this. And so Paul calls them out. They're glorying. This word glorying is the Greek word kachumia, and it means to boast, and it's actually translated boasting in all other translations. And the idea is you're taking personal satisfaction in either your achievement or the achievement of someone else. This is the attitude of the Corinthian church. They were boasting about their tolerance of sin. And so with zero subtlety at all, Paul rips the proverbial band-aid off the wound. He says, your glorying is not good. This is not okay. This is unacceptable. This thing you're doing, this behavior, it's not good. And again, why does he do this? Because we cannot address the problem until it has been exposed. Think about the medical profession for a second. What all kinds of imaging do we have? We have x-rays. We have MRIs, we have ultrasounds and sonograms and uh, PET scans and CAT scans and all these different kinds of things. Why do we have all of those? What do they have in common? They are looking inside to expose the problem. Why? Because there can be no correction where there is no exposure. We cannot operate on a problem until we know what it is and where it is. There's a problem in the Corinthian church, and Paul is exposing it. And their problem is really twofold. When we boil it down, there's two things that Paul is addressing. The first is that they don't understand the nature of sexual sin. And Paul's going to deal with that later in the chapter. Okay, We are going to get there. But the second thing is that they don't understand the danger of pride. They don't know where they're headed. Paul says you're headed to very dangerous places. Because you're glorying, you're rejoicing, you're boasting in the wrong thing. Here's the bottom line. We have an enemy. And he wants to destroy us. And one of his tactics is to infiltrate the church with sin. And he sometimes disguises it as something good. For the Corinthians, they think they're doing the right thing. They're like, look at us. We're so tolerant. We're so loving towards this man. And as we talked about a couple weeks ago, it is not loving to ignore sin. The loving thing to do is to address it. And so, this tolerance is not loving. 
And so by exposing the problem, Paul is now able to address it. So he tells them, your glorying is not good. He is exposing the problem. So our lesson here is, to fix a problem, and of course it's not going to work now. To fix a problem, fixes the blank. To fix a problem, we must first expose it. To fix a problem, we must first expose it. Paul's dealing directly and bluntly with the Corinthian church. They need to understand the danger of what they are doing. If this problem isn't fixed, the church is going to be ineffective. If the problem isn't fixed, the church is going to be ineffective. And so to protect the body from infiltration, we take two actions. First, we expose the problem. Secondly, we want to enable correction. Enable correction. So we expose the problem. How do we protect against infiltration? We expose the problem, and then we enable correction. Look at verse 6 once more. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, he's giving them information. Why? Because you can't make a correction if you don't know where to go. Okay? If you're driving down the road, what happens with our GPS on our phone or whatever you're using, when you take a wrong turn, it says, recalculating. It's going to give you new information so that you can make a course correction. That's what Paul is doing. He's giving them new information to make a course correction. He says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Paul doesn't want to just point out the problem. He wants to give them a way to fix it, okay? And so instruction enables correction. Instruction enables correction. Do you not know? This is instruction. What do they need to know? A little leaven affects the whole lump. Uh, this is a very flattering uh, picture of the church. We're a lump, okay? Now, don't you just feel really good <laughs> about yourself knowing that you are a lump? We're a lump. The picture is we're all part of the same whole. And so something that happens to a part of the lump of dough affects the whole lump. If something is going on with one of us, it's going to affect the whole body. And so for the whole body to be healthy, each of its parts needs to be healthy. Remember our illustration, a little bit of food coloring, right, affects the whole bowl of frosting. This is the Greek word micros or micro, right? A little leaven. Micro, a tiny amount, affects the whole. A seemingly insignificant amount of leaven has an impact on the entire bowl of dough. One of the jobs that I had when I was in high school was rolling pizza dough. And so I would come in each morning and I would roll the pizza dough and one night uh, someone left it out, okay? They left the dough on the shelf in the rolling room. And I come in the next morning and there is dough coming out of this bin onto the rolling table, which is, which is a couple feet, off the table and onto the floor. That is how much this dough expanded over the night. That's the picture. What Paul wants to get through to them is you're trying to excuse this and say, well, it's just a little bit of sin. It's not that big of a deal. It's just one guy. And he's saying that sin is going to affect the whole lump of dough. Everyone in the church is impacted by this one person's behavior. It doesn't take much. Biblically speaking, leaven is often used to represent sin. And so Paul is addressing a sin issue in the Corinthian church. He says, you should have mourned. We saw that a couple weeks ago. You should have been weeping over this man's behavior and instead they're rejoicing. The point Paul is making here is that a little bit of sin has an impact on the entire body of Christ. Specifically, when a church fails to deal with sin among its members, everyone in the local church is impacted. The Corinthians are rejoicing in something that's going to hurt them. That's the point that Paul is making. He wants them to correct their behavior. Right? So he's protecting them from infiltration. How is he doing that? Well, first he's exposing the problem. And now he is enabling the correction by giving them information. What does Paul's example teach us? It teaches us that correction requires instruction. Would you read that with me, please? Correction requires instruction. Paul doesn't just stop with telling them what they're doing wrong. He adds to it the rationale behind why they need to take action. 
If you let this sin remain, it's going to infiltrate the entire church. How do we protect the body from infiltration? We expose the problem, and then we enable correction. <clears throat> so that's our first condition, right? He's protecting them from infiltration. Con so condition number two. We need to protect the body from infection. Protect the body from infection. When I was eight years old, I got bit by a spider. And the problem was, we didn't realize it for a couple of days. And so one day I'm scratching my leg and I, something feels weird. And I look down and there's a point of a bite and there are red streaks going all up and down my calf. Needless to say, we rush to the doctor. And when we arrive at the doctor, let me tell you what he did not do. When we walked in, the, the doctor did not say, Hey, that's a nice bite, buddy. High five. No. He also did not say, you know what, why don't you come back when it's a little bit worse? He also did not turn to his nurses and say, hey, by the way, we're not dealing with spider bites anymore. We're going to celebrate them as good things. He didn't do any of that. What he did do was he inspected the bite, he cleaned it, and he gave me a very strong antibiotic. And as you can see, I'm okay. Maybe not mentally, but physically, I'm great. So the doctor took care of the problem. Why? Why did he take that action? Because if we had un left that untreated, it would have increased the pain, it could have led to the loss of my leg, and it could have ultimately led to the loss of my life. This is the picture that I want us to understand. Paul is this serious about their behavior. He wants them to stop. Because if they don't stop, they're going to get in big trouble later on. The only solution to an infection is to remove it. And that's where Paul goes next. We want to protect the body from infection. And to do that, we employ two practices. First, practice complete removal. Practice complete removal. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Purge out the old leaven. He tells them, glorying in sin is not good. Allowing sin to remain has a negative effect on the entire body. So what do we do? Purge out the leaven, Paul says. Get rid of it. Uh, those who came to the Seder dinner will remember Daryl talked about this. Okay, because this is the picture that Paul is painting. When the Jews had their Passover feast, what they would, one of the things they would do is they would search the house for any leaven. That's the picture. They would go around with a candle trying to locate some, and normally they would leave some behind, and when it was found, they would burn it. Paul says, purge out the leaven. Search the house. Find anything that is hindering you in your walk with Christ, and burn it. That's the picture that he is painting. So purge it, remove it, cleanse the church of sin. That's the picture. Why? So you can be a new lump of dough, he says. You, know, you want to be a new lump of dough. In several commentaries that I read, they made the comment that one of the things the Jews did was they would have kind of a starter for their bread and they would keep it all year round until Passover. And then they'd get rid of it, and they'd start a new lump of dough. That's the picture. Get rid of the starter. Get rid of the old. That's going to come up in just a second. And become a new lump of dough. Paul says, you are unleavened. What is he talking about? This is the difference between what we call position and practice. Okay? Positionally, they're one thing. They're sanctified in Christ Jesus, he said in chapter 1, verse 2. Positionally, Paul says in Romans, we're called, we're justified, we're sanctified, we're glorified, right? We're all of these things positionally, practically, in our daily lives, not so much sometimes, right? We may not consistently live sanctified lives in our practice. So our identity is in Christ, our practice, not necessarily. And so what he wants us to understand is that disobedience impacts our fellowship, not our identity, okay? It impacts our fellowship not our identity, okay? So Paul's expressing this idea that their practice needs to match their position. He's saying you are these things, you are unleavened, act like it, right? 
you are unleavened, act like it. So their practice needs to match their position. They're free from sin positionally. They need to purge it practically. And this is a complete removal, right? That's what they did at their feast. There wasn't, they didn't go like this. Well, I know that there's 11 in the back. There's a little bit of 11 in the back closet in a bag. Meh. No, they took every single speck of it out. That's what Paul says, purge the leaven. Why? Here's the picture that he's painting. Sin that is not purged spreads. Would you read that with me, please? Sin that is not purged spreads. Just like leaven. Just like the food coloring went through the whole thing. We must not allow any of it to remain. We protect from infection. So we do these two practices. First, we practice complete removal, right? Why? Because we're protecting the body from infection. So we could practice complete removal. Secondly, practice encouraging reminders. Practice encouraging reminders. I love the end of verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Why does Paul bring this up? He calls Christ our Passover. What is he talking about? Christ is the Lamb of God, right? Isn't that what John the Baptist said? John 1, 9, the next, John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's this idea. He's our Passover. He's the Lamb that was sacrificed for us. This is the motivation to get rid of leaven because Christ was sacrificed to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus is our Passover lamb, slain to pay the penalty for our sin. Paul's saying he was sacrificed for us. He died so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. How dare we continue in sin when he died to save us from it? Don't boast, Paul's telling them, about tolerating sin. Don't boast about sexual immorality. Purge the leaven. Deal with the sin. And so positionally, we are cleansed. We need to be cleansed in our practice. The reminder here is that we have been cleansed. Our sin has been dealt with. Christ was sacrificed for us. As we deal with sin in the body of Christ, this is what we need to be reminded of. And I believe it is because it is encouraging to be reminded of this fact. Christ has already dealt with our sin on the cross. Psalm 103, verse 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. It's already done. It's been taken care of. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. We who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ have been forgiven. We've been set free from sin. And this is the encouragement that we need to live lives free from sin because it's possible to live in freedom from sin. This is how we protect the body against infection. I, I picture this encouragement. So Paul has ripped off the band-aid, right? He's exposed it. And I picture this encouragement as the ointment and the bandage, right? Right? He's saying, this is the ugly wound, clean it up, and then we're going to bandage it. Christ has dealt with our sin eternally on the cross. And so, the lesson here is that encouragement motivates proper behavior. Would you read that with me, please? Encouragement motivates proper behavior. We need to encourage the body of Christ. Infection needs to be removed. But we also need to bear in mind what Christ has done for us. His finished work provides the motivation for us to live for his glory. How do we protect the body from infection? Well, we practice complete removal, and then we practice encouraging reminders. So, three conditions that the body needs to be protected from. The first was we protect it from infiltration, right? Now we protect it from infection. Condition number three Protect the body from infertility. Protect the body from infertility. One of my siblings planted a garden this year. 
And into that garden, one of their children was determined to plant a popcorn kernel. He just determined, we're going to plant this popcorn kernel. Thinking that nothing would happen, they told the child, go right ahead. On Thursday, they posted a picture of a two-foot-tall corn plant that came from the popcorn kernel. Reproduction can be a tricky thing, right? However, there are known factors that can enhance or hinder reproduction. And one of the responsibilities of the church is to reproduce, spiritually speaking. Okay? When someone is infertile, they're unable to reproduce. Okay? If a seed is infertile, it will not turn into a plant. It will not reproduce. The same is true of a church that harbors sin. It will not be able to reproduce. Growth will be stunted. The soil of the church will be corrupted. There are two ways that we protect the church from infertility. First of all, we protect with purpose. We protect with purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Therefore, let us keep the feast. This is the purpose. Paul is continuing his picture here of the Passover feast. And so what did they have to do in order to keep the feast? They had to get rid of all the leaven. They had to remove it completely. There could be no leaven present. Why? Remember what was at stake. In the first Passover, what was at stake was the survival of the nation. It is about the separation of Israel. Later on, if you failed to participate in the Passover, you were separated. You were cut off. You have to keep the feast. It was to be eaten with a pure, unblemished lamb that had been sacrificed. We have our pure, unblemished lamb, Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. But there is a continual action here. When he says, let us keep the feast, he's saying, let us keep on keeping the feast. Okay? This meant that this continual purging was necessary. What he's trying to communicate to them is this. <clears throat> I don't want you to just purge the leaven once and be like, oh, we're good. He says, you got to keep doing the feast. you got to purge it on a continual basis, just like the Israelites every year. Now, there's a balance, right? Again, our position, we're in Christ, we're completely forgiven, we're sanctified in Christ Jesus, but then our practice. Practically speaking, we need to live sanctified lives. Okay? That's the picture here. And in chapter 6, Paul's going to talk about their lives before they were saved. And I mention that because, what does he mean by when he says old leaven? Don't live like the old leaven. I think it's best to understand he's saying don't live like you used to live. <laughs> You've been bought with a price, right? You're not who you used to be. If any man be in Christ Jesus, right, what is he? He is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. That's the picture. Get rid of the old. Don't go there anymore, <laughs> What he's saying is don't get, be caught up in the sins of the past. Don't be caught up in the sins of the past. Remember who he's writing to and where they lived. Corinth was known for its sexual immorality. And he's saying, look, you're tolerating this man's sin is a return to the old leaven. Don't go there. Don't do that. We want to keep the feast, but we want to do it right. We have a purpose that protects us from infertility. What is our purpose? We want to celebrate our Passover lamb. We want to celebrate what we have in Christ. That celebration gives us a passion in proclaiming the gospel and in winning people to Jesus. The Passover was about what? It was about taking God at his word. The Passover was about demonstrating your faith in what God has said. The Passover was about the blood applied and the deliverance that that blood bought. Paul says we want to keep the feast. We want to continue to take God at his word. We want to continue to demonstrate our faith. We want to apply the blood of Christ and be delivered from sin. This is our purpose, and it delivers us from infertility. When we focus on our purpose, we reproduce. We protect the body of Christ through our purpose. And so the lesson is this. A strong purpose eliminates distraction. Would you read that with me, please? A strong purpose eliminates distraction. Every time we drive across the country, my wife and I always go, oh man, it'd be so neat to stop here or to stop there. The problem is we have a purpose, right? 
We want to get where they're going. And so we avoid the distractions. This is how our lives are supposed to be. There's going to be distractions. Our purpose helps us to avoid them. The old leaven is a distraction. The old leaven will draw us away from Christ. It will make us unable to reproduce. We want to keep the feast. We want to celebrate Jesus. And so we have a purpose. And when we focus on that purpose, we are able to be reproductive. So we want to protect the church from infertility. And we do that through our purpose. But secondly, protect through procedure. Protect through procedure. Look at the end of verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There is a procedure that we see in Scripture, and it is repeated several times. And the procedure is, you remove the bad, and you replace it with good. Remove the bad, replace it with good. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians here. What he's saying is, purge everything that is harmful and produce what is good. If you were going to plant a garden, what you would do is you would first go to the land, plot of land and you would clear the rocks and you would rototill it and you would clear the rocks and you would rototill it and you would... You get the picture, right? You would prepare the soil. You get rid of the bad and then you don't stop, right? You don't go, well, got rid of all the bad stuff, there's my garden, because nothing but weeds is going to grow. You have to replace it with good. You have to plant the seed. Again, the old leaven is best understood as, as Hebrews puts it, the sin that so easily ensnares us. Paul makes a point of mentioning the leaven of malice and wickedness. Why does he single them out? Because it's a contrast. Okay? He's making a contrast between malice and wickedness and sincerity and truth. Okay? Past behavior, new behavior is what he's saying. Malice is an unfriendly and hateful disposition. That's what malice means. And we contrast that with sincerity, right? Honest and straightforward in attitude and speech. Which one of those represents the character of a child of God, right? Then you have wickedness, perverting virtue and morality to accomplish evil. And that is opposed by truth, agreeing with reality. Are we genuine and honest? Or are we hateful and twisted? That's, that's the, what Paul's putting to them. Look, this is your old behavior. Knock it off. Do the new behavior, right? On a, so there is to be an obvious difference in the lifestyle and activity of the child of God, okay? On a basic character level, we should be different. You put off the bad and you put on the good. And Paul illustrates this concept more clearly in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Would you go there with me, please? Ephesians, just a few books to your right if you're turning in your Bible, a few finger scrolls or clicks if you're using a device. We don't care what you're using as long as you're in the Word of God, okay? It's the words that matter, not the device. It can be a book, it can be a phone, I don't care. Ephesians 4, beginning there in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning there in verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you, indeed you have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness." Three things, he says. These are the steps. If you want to live a godly lifestyle, you do three things. First, you put off the old man. And the imagery is like taking off a coat, right? You take off the old coat. And then he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I picture this personally. This isn't the biblical picture. This is a Johnism, okay? I picture this like taking a bath, right? You take off the old coat, you clean yourself up, and then you put on the new coat right? That's the picture that he is painting. How do we clean ourselves up? We are renewed by the word of God, okay? That's how we clean ourselves up. So if you try to wear two coats, you look ridiculous, right? You look silly, especially if you have a dirty, filthy coat and you just put a new one on top. It doesn't work. 
You take one off and then you put on the other. The body of Christ cannot reproduce if we're living in the old man. That's the picture here. Paul's saying, look, you're supposed to be reproducing as a church. You can't do that if you have the old leaven. If you have malice and wickedness in your life, you cannot reproduce. It's preventing that. <clears throat> the body of Christ will remain infertile until we put on the new man. And so here's the lesson. Spiritual reproduction requires transformation. Would you read that with me, please? Spiritual reproduction requires transformation. As we grow, as we are conformed to the image of Christ, we are able to make disciples. As we wrap this up, a few thoughts. <clears throat> How do we make this practical, right? We need to protect the body of Christ. We need to protect it in three conditions, from infiltration, infection, and infertility. How do we practically do that? On a personal level, in your personal life, is something hindering your growth, my growth? We must ask ourselves, have I allowed sin to infiltrate my life? Is there an infection of sin that I need to remove? Am I spiritually reproducing? Paul's words to the Corinthians are words to us all. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out the sin. Pursue sincerity and truth. Take action. <laughs> Confess any known sin. Renew your mind through the word of God and pursue righteousness. That's personal. On a relational level, in our relationships, any compromise of boundaries will result in conflict. The problem in the Corinthian church was an unwillingness to confront a brother in sin. We need to be willing to confront sin. I mean, we need to be willing to be confronted. The song we showed you earlier says all of us are broken, right? <clears throat> we come to church for the healing power of Christ and his word. We don't come here to pretend to be perfect, so please don't do that. If you're walking out of here and you've had the worst day or the worst week ever, and someone says, how are you? And you go, oh, fine, you're a liar. And you need to confess and be honest. Why? Because we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. We can't do that if, you don't, if we don't know what your burden is. All of us are broken. Our relationships are intended to draw us mutually closer to Christ. So take action. Confront sin. Encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. So personally, relationally, now we're going to meddle in your parenting. Sin in our lives will be replicated in the lives of our children. That is heavy. As a parent, we must deal with our sin first. But we also deal with the sin of our children. You are the parent, and you need to act like it. I am a parent. I need to be a parent. Paul, he told the Corinthians at the beginning, I'm parenting you here, right? He's parenting the Corinthians. And you know what he doesn't say to them? He doesn't go to them and say, I am so disappointed in you. He doesn't go to them and say, do you realize how bad you're making me look? No, he goes to them and he says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Where does he point them? He directs their attention to Christ. That's our job as parents. Not to tell our children, you're making me look bad, or I'm so, you're, you're disappointing me, but to tell them, this is about Christ. So take action. Deal with your sin. Deal with my sin. And then we point our children to Jesus. Marriage. Marriage. We fall too easily into patterns. Unhealthy marriage habits lead to unhealthy parenting and ultimately will lead to disconnection from the church. Unhealthy marriage habits lead to unhealthy parenting which leads to a disconnection from your local church. A strong church is built on a strong family, and a strong family is built on a strong marriage. It is not okay to treat your spouse with less love and respect than you would give to Christ. Please read Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. It is not okay to treat your spouse with less love and respect than you would Christ. That's what Ephesians 5 tells us. So take action, communicate well, invest time, money, and hard work into your marriage. I want to take just a minute to write down a commitment in your notes there. 
And the goal of this is to tell somebody else what you have committed to so that they can hold you accountable. So why is all of this necessary? This is necessary because we want to protect the church. The protection of the body of Christ is the responsibility of each of its members. The protection of the body of Christ is the responsibility of each of its members. Don't boast about sin or your tolerance of it. Don't allow the smallest speck of leaven into the dough. Why? Because Christ was sacrificed for our sin, and we dare not allow it to remain in our lives. Put off the works of the flesh, Paul says. Put on the works of righteousness. Finally, make a conscious, deliberate choice to protect the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word and for how it cuts us deep. We need to protect the body of Christ. And the way that we're going to do that is by personal holiness and by a willingness to confront sin. And so, Father, we want to protect the body. We want to protect it from infection. We want to protect it from infiltration, from infertility. We want to protect the body, but we need to take action to do that. And I pray that we would take that action. I ask, Father, that today, that this week, that every moment of our lives, all the things that we say, that we do, and that we think, would bring praise and honor and glory to you and your name. I ask, Lord, that you would give us safety as we go from here, and that your word would remain with us, that we would think on it and meditate on it, and that it would change our lives. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.